everyone. Welcome to Eastview Online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, Jason and I were chatting offline before this and we we're like, hey, we haven't gotten to host together before. No, it's so, great to be with you today, Connor. Yeah, Thanks man. for letting me join in. I yes. appreciate that. Before we go into kind of our usual stuff, why don't we start off the top. Happy Fourth of July weekend That's right. to yeah. everyone. Yeah, hoping that you guys are being able to celebrate something and actually you know, it's a reminder that whatever we have an opportunity to celebrate, we can do that in a way that invites other people in. And so, you know, obviously I'm a small groups guy, right? But living on mission's a big deal. And even just inviting people over for a barbecue and enjoying this weekend might be a good one. But Connor, I'm really interested. How do you how does your family celebrate? The 4th of July. Yeah, for us, you know, we've got a three-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, so yeah. anything yeah. after 7.30, which is strict bedtime, All right. is off limits. So right now, we're in the season, we're trying to, like, keep everyone from crying when fireworks go off. <laughs> but one day, we're right. looking forward to when we get to go to the fireworks shows. So yeah. we might throw, do some poppers and okay. some, some sparklers work. and call it a night. What about you guys? Well, we're in a little bit of a different stage of life, right? A little bit older kids, and we actually enjoy kind of doing our own show from time to time. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not supposed to say that right because it's Illinois but we enjoy oh, we enjoy it so that's get, right I forgot that anyway that's a thing you guys are welcome to come over sometime and yeah. we'll, we'll light some fireworks Free fireworks <laughs> at the sniff home well there you go maybe you're on the road this weekend uh, traveling traveling to see family uh, maybe it's baseball or sports with the kids wherever you're at we're so glad that you're joining us and if this is your first time joining us online we'd love for you to text hello there's a number at the bottom of the screen that allows you to uh, submit a prayer request, ask any question that you may have about Eastview, and we'd encourage you to, to go ahead, text that number, try it out. There are people, believe it or not, that right. will ask me, like offline, they'll say, does that text hello thing work? Do it people does. actually respond back, and it's true, they do. It we have I've, been, I've even tried it before myself, in service, it works, trust me. Yes, we have a real team of people that just want to be there for you in any way uh, that they can, and Jason's actually going to be hosting um, in the big house today as well, right. yeah. and so uh, he he was telling me that, you know, because of the series that we're in, Miracles, Jesus is Walking on Water, I don't want to take all of his thunder, but there might be like a state, there might be a, like a little uh, pool on stage, water coming from the ceiling, <laughs> just to help, funny, to help yeah. the speaker, you know, play out <laughs> Jesus Walking on the Water. Is, can we expect that today uh, in the service maybe. today, Jason? No, probably not. But okay. what we can expect, though, Connor, is, uh, so we have Brent uh, Bramer coming from Slow City Church, and we'll learn more about him and in their church has been a church plant, but God's just been thriving in their midst. They live out the same vision that we do, which is mm. to love our community and to live on mission and just to be ourselves wherever we're at. And so I know we're, we're gonna be blessed today by, by Brant and just the message that he brings. Yeah. Yes, we're excited for the service to be starting soon. Before we get there, you, you mentioned living out a mission. And mm. you know, if you're someone who calls Eastview home, no matter where you live, we have an opportunity for you to bring Eastview to you. Uh, that's what this kind of short campaign is called. And so uh, if you're outside of McLean County, you're within the state of Illinois, no matter really where you are, if you love Eastview and you wish that you could bring Eastview to where you live, uh, go to eastview.church slash enews, schedule a call with me. Uh, you'll see when you go in the enews an opportunity right. to schedule right. just a Zoom, a Zoom call. Uh, and basically what we're wanting to do is we want to provide resources and opportunities for people to start a gathering in Eastview in their home at their local coffee shop, uh, maybe at a local uh, rented space in your town. No matter where it is, we want to help you uh, we want to help you do that um, in the name of Jesus on behalf of Eastview. That would be a cool opportunity. So take us up on that. Um, but the service is going to be starting right after this. We're excited to see what God is going to do in the service. And we're so glad that you're joining us today. We hope you enjoy.
Well, good morning, Eastview. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to sing this morning. We're here to worship the King with joy in our hearts. There's joy in this house today. Let's go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We shout out your praise and joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you, to be in this house together, whether you're here in person or you're joining us online. We're just so glad that you're here today in this place. And in this miracle series that we've been in for the last few weeks, we've taken time to pray. And as we continue to worship this morning, um, I'm going to read a prayer from this little book called Every Moment Holy. And it's this prayer is a little bit different and special because it talks about the topic of doubt. And wherever you are coming in today, maybe there's something that you're doubting, whether it's the Lord, his presence, his goodness, maybe what he says about you. And as I as I read this prayer, my my request is that you pray it with me 
it's in the first person. So would you just put yourself in these words as we pray together? Oh, Lord, I would that my heart was ever strong. My faith always firm and unwavering, my thoughts unclouded, my devotion sincere, my vision clear. I would that I would dwell always in that state wherein my belief, my hope, my confidence were rooted and certain. I would that I could remain in those seasons when assailing storms seem only to make faith stronger, proving your presence and your providence. But it is not always so. There are those other moments as now when I cannot sense you near, cannot hear you, see you, touch you, times when fear or depression or frustration overwhelm, and I find no help or consolation when the sea walls of my faith crumble and give way to the inrushing tides of doubt. Have I believed in vain? Are your words true? They seem so distant to me now. Is your presence real? I cannot feel it. Do you love me, or are you indifferent to my grief? Under weight of such darkness, how can I remember the sunlight of your love as anything more than a child's dream? Under weight of such doubt, how can I still proclaim to my own heart with certainty that you are real? And so, Jesus, I do now the only thing I know to do. Here I drag my heavy heart again into this cleared and desolate space to see if you will meet me in my place of doubt, even as you mercifully met your servant Thomas in his uncertainty, even as you once acted in compassionate response to a fearful father who desperately pleaded, I believe, Lord, help me with my unbelief. For where else but to you might I flee with my doubts? You alone have the words of eternal life. This I know to be true, my Lord and my God. You are not in the least angered by my doubts and my questions, for they have often been the things that lead me to press closer into you, seeking the comfort of your presence, seeking to understand the roots of my own confusion. So also use these present doubts for your purposes, O Lord. I offer them to you. Even as the patriarch Job made of his pain and confusion a petition, even as the psalmists again and again carried their cries, their questions, their laments to you, so would I be driven by my doubts to despair of my own strength and knowledge and righteousness and control and instead to seek your face, knowing that when I plead for proof, what I need most is your presence. In your presence. I can offer my questions knowing you are never threatened by my insecurities. They do not change your truth. My doubts cannot unseat your promises. You are a rock, O oh Christ, and your truth is a bulwark that I might dash myself against until my strength is spent and I collapse at last in despair, only then to feel the tenderness of your embrace as you stoop to gather me to yourself, drawing me to your breast and cradling me there where I find I am held again by a love that even my doubts cannot undo. Oh Lord, how many times have you graciously led me through doubt into a deeper faith? Do so again, my Lord and my God. Even now, do so again. You alone are strong enough to carry the weight of my troubled thoughts, even as you alone are strong enough to bear the burden of my sin and guilt and my shame, my wounds, and even my brokenness. Oh, Christ, let my doubts never compel me to hide my heart from you. Let them rather arise as questions to begin holy conversations, invert these doubts, turning them to invitations to be present, to be honest, to seek you, to cry out to you to bring my heart fully into the struggle rather than to seek to numb it. Let my doubts become invitations to wrestle with you through such dark nights of the soul as Jacob when he wrestled with the angel until the day breaks anew and I'm fresh wounded by your love and resting in the blessing of peace again in your presence. Now, O oh Lord, may the end result of my doubt be a more precious and hard-wrung faith, resilient as the Methuselah tree, and a hope more present and evergreen, and a more tender and active mercy extended to those in their own seasons of doubting. 
So help me, my Lord and my God. I have no consolation but you. Meet me now in this eclipse shadow of my doubt. Lead me again into your light. Amen. We're going to continue to sing together. Sing to the God who is the, the same as he always has been and always will be. So will you call on the name of the Lord with us? I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh, we sing, and oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. And oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. We stand on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible, yes. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Come on. Oh, God, my God. God. Let's sing this out. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then. And you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now.
your faithfulness. Sing it one more time. And oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now, Jesus. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. God, that's our prayer, that you are a steadfast rock and that you are faithful. We give you all the honor and the glory. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Malachi 3 says it this way, I, the Lord, do not change. Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We just sang this, but I know that many of you, as I look across this room, You believe this to be true, that the same God that heard and helped and healed generations past is the same God that is hearing us, that's listening, that wants to heal us, that wants to restore the things that are broken in our life today. And it's because of his love. Uh, Psalm 105 says it this way, he remembers his covenant love, his steadfast love, his faithful love forever. And that's why this time of communion is an act of worship. Because we can remember the truth about our life, that Jesus cares for us, that he uh, is listening to us, that he heals us. He wants to meet you exactly where you are at. Uh, If you had ever come to our house in our family room, just above our TV on the wall is a big picture frame. It's got scripture on it. I'll read that scripture in a second. But it was a gift to us from a couple in our small group when we were going through a difficult time in our life, just to remind us, of the truth, that he is the same God. I'll read that for us now as you get your elements ready for communion. It's uh, Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. Listen to these words today. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Amen? Amen. Let's take communion together. First, the bread. It represents Christ's body broken for you and for me. Let's take. And then the juice represents God's, his his sacrifice for us. Let's take and eat and drink. Father God, thank you that you are the same God. You never change. You are always with us. Your promises are true and right and steadfast. So God, we trust you. Help our unbelief in the areas that that we're just missing the mark. God, restore in us the joy of your salvation. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, Eastview, we're going to continue in uh, the Gospel of John in our miracle series. And in just a few minutes, Pastor Brent Bramer is going to be coming and preaching through John 6, the miracle of Jesus walking on water. But Pastor Brent's coming from Slow City Church. Slow is San Luis Obispo in California, and they are doing some amazing work. Some of you uh, know their family. His wife, Jenna, grew up here at Eastview. And I think I have it right. You guys met at Cincinnati Bible College, I believe, right? All right, and uh, they have been faithfully serving God for over 18 years in a lot of different ministry settings, but most recently it was slow as a church plant, and God is moving in their midst. One of the cool things that you'll catch as he's preaching is that they literally believe and live uh, what they know to be true, the vision that Jesus saves people. And so we're excited uh, to walk with them as they've been planting this church. We're excited for what uh, Brent is going to bring today. But first, we're going to learn a little bit more about slow, so check out this video. Hey, my name is Brent Bramer. I'm the lead pastor of Slow City Church in San Luis Obispo, California. And I can't thank you enough for your generosity and your belief in church planting and church planters and in the gospel movement happening around the country and around the world. 
In September of 2019, we launched. Six months later was COVID. Everything locked down and shut down, but God continued to build his church. For two and a half years, our church was a little nomadic. We met together outside on football fields and open fields and specifically in a parking lot. Without a worship facility to rent or to move into, we waited. After three and a half years, we moved in on April 2nd and this Easter, this Easter, God blew us away with almost 1,400 people in attendance to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We have seen over 80 baptisms. We've seen hundreds of people who have had their faith rescued. One at a time, they have met Jesus. Because of the belief that you have in the power of the gospel, that Slow City is experiencing the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And I am so excited to tell you that this little church on the Central Coast is investing in more church plants along the coast of California. We want to see the way of Jesus transform everything. And we're gonna continue to carry that missional heart to plant churches that plant churches. It's because of your generosity and prayers for us that the mission of God, that the way of Jesus will continue. And we're just so thankful to be a part of this with you. Amen. Well, good morning, Eastview. How you doing? Good. Really, 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 really good to be with you. My name is Brent, and I am humbled to be uh, the lead pastor, church planter at Slow City Church. But my story is not just my story, it is our story. Um, Jason shared that my wife, Jenna, grew up at Eastview going to Oasis. The last time I was in this room was 19 years ago. And my wife and I were getting married on this stage. The carpet was mauve and there were steps coming up to it. Do you remember that? Um, but I, it is just so, so, so good to be back here uh, with you from San Luis Obispo, California. It's a little muggier here, which I actually really appreciate. I really appreciate it. Uh, before I go any farther, I want to just say again and again and again, thank you. Thank you for being a church that invests in people um, that loves Jesus deeply, richly, a praying church that invests in other people, that invests in church planting. Um, your team, your leadership team, your elder board, Tommy, Tyler, so many people have prayed, have called, have actually visited, have given financially, and it makes, it makes an incredible difference. It has been a strength to us. Um, my family is uh, continuing to grow, and my wife and I have been married for 18, or 19 years, sorry, 18, 19. It's coming up on 19. Uh, 19 years, and together we have four kids. And when you speak in a new place, you always got to bring family photos. So here's a picture uh, of my family. Um, there's Jenna, uh, our oldest. Keegan is about to turn 16. Cole and Hattie and Isla, they are the joy of our life. Now, this is a beautiful picture, right? Beautiful picture. But here is a more realistic view of our life together. It's in the next picture. We also have dogs. And um, this is Moose and Mac. And um, raising a family, church planting, doing life, navigating this world in general uh, can be a little exhausting and like where you can't get your hands around everything. We, we're laughing. Oh, we're laughing, but it was... Have you ever felt or been in a season of life where you're just tired, um, where you're just a little exhausted, where you're a little at the end of your rope, where it just feels like, man, I can't catch a breath. I turned 40 this year and I am feeling it. I am feeling it. I'm getting tired. I'm getting more tired. Um, and church planting has definitely helped that. I read an article this past week entitled, Exhausted Nation that shared three out of five U.S. adults say they feel more tired now than ever before. Have you found that to be true in your life? Three out of five feel more tired now in 2023 with all our amenities and all our connection and all our information than ever before. Have you felt that, that post-COVID exhaustion? I'm a definition person. Exhausted means drained of one's physical or mental resources. Frustrated means feeling distressed due to the inability to change or achieve something. You ever been exhausted? Are you exhausted today? Have you ever been frustrated? 
When we moved to Slow about six years ago, um, we moved into this little house, the only house that we could afford to rent. It was like a thousand square foot, three bedroom, one bath. I will not tell you the rent price in San Luis Obispo. Um, you would be mortified. Um, but one of the first things that we did is we said, we, we put, we had four kids, so we put two boys in a room, and we put two girls in a room. And I bought, we, we got on Wayfair or Ikea actually, and we bought our girls the, this princess bed two stories, steps up to the side because we had to fit it in the room. And it came the next day that we landed in San Luis Obispo and we opened up all the boxes and it came as Ikea does in like a million pieces. And it's warm and I, but I'm gonna be dad of the year. I'm gonna make this princess bed and I tear through it and all the pieces fall and I'm not reading instructions. I'm looking at pictures and I'm trying to put knobs into things and turn, I just have, I can't find my tools. I just have the Allen wrench and that tiny little like wrench. And I'm trying, I'm, I, I start in the morning and I'm frustrated. My wife comes to the door and she says, do you need help? And I'm like, I don't need any help. And she goes away and morning turns to noon, right? And she says, do you want some lunch? I'm like, no, I do not want lunch. I wanna fix the princess bed. I, I'm, I'm sweating, I'm frustrated, I, my hands are bleeding, right? And she comes to the door and she says, do you want me to call my dad? <laughs> he lives in Bloomington, Illinois, Doug Parker. He's a builder. I said, no, I do not want you to call your father. Please, you know, and I'm like all day from, from morning all the way into the evening, the sun begins to set and I have still not completed the princess bed. Finally, dinner's on the table and I recognize I put the whole stinking thing together backwards, right? And I am just so depleted, so in a, what, what is it? I am drained of my physical and my mental resources. I am feeling distressed due to my inability to change something, to produce something, to achieve something. Have you ever been in that place? <laughs> Frustrated, exhausted, tired, overwhelmed, having your wife ask you if you need your father-in-law's help, right? Questioning your manhood, right? The whole thing. Have you ever been there in life? A season of life where it just felt like you just couldn't put the pieces together in your relationship, with your finances. Maybe you're so busy, but you had no break. There was no progress. There was no change in your marriage or in your relationship status or with those internal thoughts and accusations that you keep playing in your mind on repeat and you just felt depleted. Have you ever been there? Me too. Why am I talking about this? Well, we have been, Yusufi, you've been in a series walking through the book of John, looking at the miracles of Jesus. And today I get to walk through a passage that I have never taught in 20 plus years of ministry, never taught, um, which I'm really excited about. And I'm kind of shocked that I've never been able to preach this before, but I'm really excited to walk through something new for me. As I've walked through this passage and this miracle of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has met me, challenged me, pressed me, encouraged me, and this will be an imperfect sermon, but I believe that a perfect God can meet you right in the middle. And there's a miracle today, right in the middle of whatever it is that you might be facing. And it's not me, it's not stage, it's not lights, it's Jesus. We're gonna be in John chapter six. And the setting in John chapter six, we'll start in verse, we'll start in verse 15 here in just a minute. But John chapter six, the sun is setting on a pretty intense day. From about six in the morning till supper time and beyond, Jesus and the disciples have been working something. 5,000 people plus come to Jesus this day and they are hungry. They, he has been praying. The disciples and Jesus have been ministering to people, meeting with people in their real need. And they have seen something incredible. Jesus just took what a few people had in their hands and he said, will you trust me with it? And Jesus multiplied that gift and fed 5,000 people. Now the response of this, taking just a few, I believe five and two, and bringing it and feeding 5,000 plus people is remarkable. They are astonished, they are stunned, and they rush at Jesus. They see an opportunity here. This guy's not only powerful, he's a bread maker. 
right? He can give us bread on a daily basis. We have to make this, this is a power of God moment. They see an opportunity to crown Jesus as king. So they rush Jesus. And in verse 15 of chapter six, here's what we read. John gives us this glimpse. It says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain to get away by himself. Jesus, knowing that they were trying to force him into something that he was not, some political or military figure, withdraws to a mountain alone to pray. So he actually leaves the crowd. He walks away. You see this a ton in Jesus's life. Jesus will get all of this attention on himself and he'll push it away to step into a moment of prayer. This is not the message today, but that's a study in itself. That's a message in itself. How many times did Jesus step away from attention, from pressure to to grab power, to take power, to make this all about something that it wasn't? And he stepped into a relational moment with the Father to seek his presence, to seek his voice, to get direction, to receive an identity. Luke writes in Luke chapter five, verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Man, I want that said of me. And in this instance, when the crowds of people are rushing Jesus with all of this pressure, with all of this expectation, he looks at his friends and he says, okay, guys, now you get in the boat too. You gotta get out of here. I don't want this stuff filling your mind. This is not what this is gonna look like. Mark six, verse 45, it says, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side because it's been a day. It's been messy. It's been amazing. It's been exciting. It's been exhausting. They have been meeting needs and alluding and pushing back, managing some expectations. So Jesus says, you get in the boat, go to the other side. I'm going to go to the mountain. I'm going to pray. I'll meet you on the other side whenever I show up. And they're like, all right, Jesus, we're tired. They're looking forward to this, I believe. And here's where our story really picks up. John chapter six, verse 16 through 18. It says this, when evening came, his disciples did what Jesus said. His disciples went down to the lake where they got into the boat and they set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now, the sun had set, it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. Verse 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. I love reading the gospels and reading these little intricacies that eyewitnesses who were actually in the place will give us. And John is giving us some of these details. There are parallel passages in Matthew and Mark that add different details to this story. We're gonna mainly sit with John. But John says, they get in, it's evening. They set across the lake. Jesus was not with them. And he gives us, he gives us some indication of what the disciples were up against. Number one, it was dark. And number two, it was difficult. Now, I believe the disciples got in the boat and they're like, thank God we are away from all those people. Man, that was crazy, wasn't it? It was incredible, but I am exhausted. And these are skilled fishermen, skilled sailors. They get into the boat and they're thinking, we're gonna just put up the sail. We'll kick up our feet. We'll have some sardines. We'll just chill. We'll coast. We'll take a nap as we coast across the Sea of Galilee. Not crazy big. We'll be there in an hour or so. But John says it gets dark and it gets difficult. A strong wind was blowing directly into their face. And what they expected to be restful became increasingly exhausting and frustrating. The wind starts to blow and it's picking up and the waves start to pick up. The Sea of Galilee sits 600 feet below sea level. The wind is blowing over this mountain range and full into their faces. They have to drop sail, pick up the oars, and they are trying to do what Jesus has asked them to do. They are paddling, they are sweating, they are encouraging each other. They are, their hands are growing tired. And in five to seven hours later, they still haven't reached the other side. John writes, they had rowed about three or four miles in the fourth watch of the night. We get that, in, that, that detail from Matthew in the fourth watch of the night. They've been paddling into the wind 
for five to seven hours and they had only made it about halfway across the lake. Can you imagine the frustration, the feeling of there is no change, there is no progress, we are working hard, we are trying hard, we are doing everything. That, can you imagine the annoyance or the anger or the, the willingness to just be like, you know what, let's turn this boat around, we'll meet Jesus some other time when the winds die down, but they continue to work in some certain, can you imagine the exhaustion? Their hands are bloodied from the blisters of hours of just pulling at the oars, their muscles are tired, their bones are aching, because it's starting to rain. They are physically exhausted. They are mentally exhausted. They are emotionally exhausted. They are spiritually tired. Can you imagine? I know in a room this size, many of us, maybe three out of five of us, are there today, exhausted, tired, ready to throw in the towel, and they are just stuck in the middle of that. Are you there? I sat with a friend this past week who plainly said, Brent, man, I work so hard. I try and do right by people. I do business the right way with integrity, but what gives? Why isn't God giving me what, what I think I deserve? Nothing works. Everything is a struggle. And it doesn't seem like anything is ever gonna change. I'm not gonna be to the place of comfort. I have another friend named Mark. I met Mark. My family and I met Mark on our walks to school with our kids when we first moved to San Luis Obispo. We met Mark a month after his neighbor's house burned down. They woke up in the middle of the night, they heard screamings, they heard sirens, they smelled smoke, they ran out, they stood in the driveway and they watched as the older gentleman who lived there, they watched in horror as he went in one last time to try and rescue his dog and didn't come out. And they sat there with his wife he said, Brent, that was horrifying. But since that day, we've just been a total mess. My daughter's been having nightmares and asking questions that I do not know the answer to. Questions like, dad, what happens when we die? Brent, I don't know the answer to that. Dad, how do we pray? He said, Brent, I've never prayed a prayer in my life. Dad, I feel afraid, I'm nervous. And he said, I'm so frustrated and anxious because I don't know how to do any of those things. I don't know the answers to those questions and I'm trying to comfort her and I'm trying to sit with her and I'm trying to listen to her, but it is so exhausting. We're not sleeping, we're not eating. It has totally debilitated our family. I've never been to church or had a talk with God. I don't know how to help. I don't know how to fix this. I feel stuck. See, you and I, if we are not exhausted, tired, or frustrated, or at, the, at our wit's end, will at some point in our life run into a storm where we are full headwind, grabbing the oars, just trying to make progress. And the question today is where do you and I go in these moments? Where do we go in these moments? What do we do in these moments when we have a string of overwhelming circumstances that are too big to handle? We have a string of hard relationships. We have a string of work demands and struggles or letdowns when someone that you trusted failed you. When you feel like you are in the boat that even Jesus told you to get into and you're doing the thing that Jesus has asked you to do and yet you're not feeling it. You feel tired, you feel stressed, you feel exhausted in these moments. Where do we go? I have a tendency in my life, my 40 short years of life, I know myself. I have a tendency in these moments of overwhelmingness to be driven and dictated by my circumstances, to allow the storm to speak loudly into my ear. When I, when I am tired, when I am busy, when I am overwhelmed or anxious or burnt out in a difficult and dark season of life, I have to be careful because I know that circumstances can tend to drive my direction, drive or dictate even what I believe to be true. Be real for a moment. When storms hit, it's easy to start to tell, your thing, tell yourself things that you thought you would never say. You're not trusting God, but I'm in this alone. Nobody understands what I'm going through. There's no one that sees or fully understands. No one cares. Nobody's coming to help me. 
I've been reading uh, a lot about uh, why we think the way that we think. Why we think the way that we think and, and about some of our core beliefs. And I, I learned Lisa, uh, recently about cognitive distortion. Cognitive distortion. Now, cognitive distortions are your mind, my mind, convincing us to believe negative things about yourself and your world that are not necessarily true. That's what cognitive distortions are. Jeffrey Schwartz, um, in his book, You Are Not Your Brain, calls these cognitive distortions deceptive brain messages. Actually, when our brain, false or inaccurate thoughts, unhelpful, distracting impulses, urges, or desires that take you away from your true goals and intentions of life, intentions in life. And I've been reading about this because it's fascinating to me how we can find ourselves in a storm, in a circumstance, in a relational status or stuckness where we can start to deceive ourselves. We can be driven into believing, I'll never get through this. I'm gonna be a person of blame or bitterness. We can allow ourselves to be deceived by urges, impulses, distracting desires that can actually take us away from our true goals and intentions of life. And we see this in the disciples in this story. They're in the boat, they're doing their thing, they're rowing hard, and yet their belief, their faith, starts to change. See, they had reason to believe and trust and rely and cry out to Jesus. Remember, the day, that day, they saw Jesus take some fish and some loaves and feed 5,000 people, and everyone's astonished. They have seen Jesus meet people, pray with people, heal the blind, stand the lame up, restore broken people, put them back together. They've seen him quiet a storm. But then, They feel like they are on their own. Circumstances change. The storm picks up and starts to deceive them. Their circumstance starts to lead their thoughts and their feelings. Look at this. Jesus comes to them walking on the water and notice their response. John chapter six, verse 19 says this. Then they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they said, and they were frightened. They see what looks like Jesus walking on the water and they were terrified. Matthew chapter 14, verse 26 said that when they saw what looked like Jesus, they said, it's a ghost. They said, and they cried out in fear. Now, here's what's crazy about this. They know Jesus. They know what Jesus looks like. They know how he walks. They know how he talks. They know his character, his nature, that he is kind, gentle, powerful, authoritative, but full of grace. Why are they afraid? Why are they afraid? And I see in this, they were more willing to believe that a ghost is coming to crush them, to curse them, than it is Jesus actually coming to save them. What changes in their mind, their circumstances? See, your circumstances and mine, the storms in your life and mine can easily trick us to believe, man, God's out to get me. I'm working so hard. He doesn't see, he doesn't care. He's not coming for me. He's coming to curse me. And the disciples are right there going, man, we're tired. We're exhausted. Oh, look, a ghost. It figures, it figures that we've been out here for seven hours working our tails off. And now a ghost is gonna come and totally smite us. How easy is it for you and I, for us to forget the faithfulness of God? to be overwhelmed away from remembering the power and the presence of God. What storms are you facing today? And what are you believing today? The core of who you are, about yourself, about others, about God. See, the disciples, they go to this distorted reality where their circumstances are leading their believing. The storms around them are leading what they believe. But we're gonna see Jesus flip that. And he's gonna invite them into a kind of belief that will guide them through their circumstances. And that flip, that change is everything in life. 
Look, Jesus approaches the boat. They walk on, he's walking on water, which is incredible. They were frightened. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. I just want to make a few observations through this passage. Jesus walks into their situation. Jesus walks right up to them in their situation. Jesus comes to the boat and he's walking on water. He is approaching them through the wind, through the waves, on the water, coming to them. And he walks right into their situation. Why? I was talking to my dad. My dad lives in Louisville, Kentucky, and we catch up almost every day for about one minute and 45 seconds. I time it often. And I asked, I was like, he was like, what are you doing today? I said, I'm, you know, I'm pre- preparing this message to preach in Bloomington. And, and uh, I said, what do you think, dad? Why did Jesus walk on the water? And my dad, man, he said, uh, well, maybe he didn't want to get his robe wet. <laughs> and he gives that dad laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, no, seriously. He's like, I don't know. Maybe Jesus couldn't swim. I was like, <laughs> he laughs on the other side. And then he goes, oh, I don't know. I think it's because uh, he was the man and his friends were in trouble. And I thought, that's profound, dad. He was the man, his friends were in trouble. I like that. Dan Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lonely, uh, Lowly, says of Jesus, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. He was approachable. People wanted to come to him. And we also see all throughout the New Testament that Jesus was one of the most approaching people. He would approach Zacchaeus when he was hiding up a tree. He approached Bartimaeus who was blind. He approached the woman caught in the act of adultery where a bunch of religious men were waiting to stone her. He approached, he spoke with, he was approachable. And his friends we're struggling. That's why Jesus walked on the water, water, because that's where his friends were struggling. That's where they were tired. That's where they were overwhelmed. That's where they were anxious. That's where they were afraid. See, I want you to know this. God is the God who comes to you and I right in the middle of whatever it is you and I are walking through. God is the God who walks right into your situation, not to smite you, not to condemn you, not to curse you, not to haunt you, but to invite you into something different, into the middle of the chaos. Look at what Jesus says. It is I. Don't be afraid. It is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus walks into their situation and and Jesus speaks to their fear. He speaks directly to their fear. He comes from them and he says, I know you believe you are in a sinking ship. I know you believe that you are alone and I don't care. I know that you believe that no one is coming for you, but I have come. Listen to my voice. Do not be afraid. This has probably been overstated and overpreached in every sermon everywhere, but do not be afraid is one of the most repeated phrases in all of scripture. Why? Because you and I are often afraid. We mask our fear in many different ways, but you and I often can get to places of just deep seated fear. Henry Nouwen writes of fear, one of my favorite authors, fear is the great enemy of intimacy, intimacy being closeness, being confidence, being security, being being known and seen and loved and valued. Fear is the great enemy of closeness. Uh, I read this past week in an IJM um, publication of Kashi. Kashi was born in Mumbai, India, and she was sold into an industry that used her for her body. She was five when she was sold. She writes and talks about how fear was all that she knew. She was sold to three different entities by the time that she was 15. And she wrote, I have cried in dark rooms alone. I have gone days without food or water. I was beaten for showing my sadness. I had no friends, no school, no birthdays, no life. I was afraid of every noise, every person. And sometimes I got angry and wondered, 
Why have I ever been born? What is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? After years and years of life in a dark place, she writes, I knew that no one was looking for me. I was forgotten. But then, International Justice Mission showed up. At first, I was terrified of them. They said, we are here for you. We have come to set you free. But I was reluctant. I was afraid. I wouldn't believe it, but they kept coming. And they kept coming again and again. And they just said those words, do not be afraid. We're here to help you. Do not be afraid. We care about you. When she realized, she writes about realizing their heart, their motives were good, were pure, that they were fighting for her. When she realized those realities, that a group of people were there for her rescue, her fear began to quiet. Didn't go away, but her fear began to quiet and she felt comfort for the first time in her life. John writes in 1 John 4, 18 of fear, that only perfect love, Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And Jesus sees his friends struggling, heading in a direction, walks into their situation and speaks directly to their fears. And he says, I'm here for you. I know you have been through it. I know what you believe about yourself when you look in the mirror. I know the things that you are hearing. I know it, I see it, but it is I do not be afraid. Maybe that is for you today to hear the powerful, loving words of Jesus for you. It is I, it's me. Don't be afraid. When you hear the voice of Jesus, when you see that he is for you, that he is fighting for you, that he will pursue you and approach you even in the storm that you are facing, you recognize he is Lord in the middle of it all, something changes. First, the third observation that we see in this passage is that G Jesus is Lord in the storm. He's Lord in the storm. The disciples see him walking on the water. They realize it's not a ghost. They hear his voice. They hear him speak to their fear. And it's like they have this aha moment. Only then, verse 21 says, then they were willing to take him into the boat. Fascinating verse. There was a moment that they were not willing to take him into the boat. They saw him standing on the water outside of the boat. What changed? Their invitation to trust. Their invitation to not be afraid. Their invitation to welcome him in. Jesus is Lord in the storm. It says, then they were willing to take him into the boat. The King James Version says, then they willingly received him. The, the New Living says, then they were eager to let him into the boat. Why the shift? From it's a ghost, we're gonna die to, oh my goodness, this is God. Get in the boat, Jesus. Get in the boat with me. Mark 6, 51, parallel passage says, at this moment, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and the fish earlier in the day. Their hearts were hardened at that moment. I love this intricacy, this detail. There was a moment that day that their hearts were embittered. They were frustrated. Their hearts were hardened. They were not soft, but, but when they hear Jesus, it is I, do not be afraid. Their hearts soften to what Jesus wanted to do in them. Matthew gives us another, another intricacy of the story. Matthew chapter 14, 33, it says, then those who were in the boat worshiped him. They stopped, they dropped the oars and they say, truly, you are the son of God. They're like, let the wind take us if they have to, but we have, our eyes are fixed on you, we trust you, we see you. They have this aha moment that Jesus is Lord in the midst of the storm. I guess one of those Bible scholars in the boat probably had all these passages run through his mind. Psalm 93, verse four, more than the sounds of many waters and the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Look at Jesus walking on the water, inviting us to trust. Isaiah 40, verse nine, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who has stood on the sea? I can see Matthew just 
reveling in Isaiah 40, Psalm 95, verse 5, the sea is his, for it was he who made it. They have this aha moment as Jesus comes walking on the water into their situation, speaking to their fear. He's Lord in the storm. And get this, they welcome him in, but Jesus waits to be welcomed. Jesus waits to be welcomed into the boat. If that's me, like I'm swimming out there, right? I'm swimming out there. I'm like grabbing into the boat and I'm like, give me the oars, right? And I'm like going, I'm going to be, Jesus stands on the waves and he waits to be welcomed. God will never, Jesus very rarely forces himself into your life. He waits to be welcomed. He will invite you. It is I, do not be afraid, but he waits to be welcomed into the situation. What happens when we welcome Jesus into our overwhelmingness, our exhaustion, our anxiety, our trying really, 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 really hard, our grief, our pain, our fear? A miracle happens when we welcome Jesus into the boat. In John chapter six, verse 21, this is the miracle. Immediately, the boat, boat reached the shore where they were heading. What? They've been paddling for seven hours. Their hands are blistered and bloodied. They've probably been yelling at each other. They're angry, they're anxious, they're tired, they're afraid. They've been doing all this work, doing exactly what Jesus asked them to do. They're terrified. They're believing things about themselves, about God, about others that are not true. They're cognitively distorted. And then Jesus shows up and he says, it is I, do not be afraid. They welcome him into the boat. And when Jesus is welcomed in, he gets into the boat with them. They worship him. And immediately the boat reaches shore. They're like, hmm, would have been nice if you were here earlier, Jesus, right? But immediately they got to where they were headed. Immediately, somehow, some way, miracle of God. Jesus shows up, gets in the boat, and he's like, I'm here. I got this. And I don't know if it was instantaneous. I don't know if they were so wrapped up in worship that the wind shifted by the hand of God and just blew them to the shore. I don't know how it looked and how it worked. But immediately, their work stopped, their fears subsided, their eyes were opened, and they arrived to the place that they were going as Jesus was in the boat with them. Can I tell you, um, the past five or six years for the life of my family has been really exciting. It's been an adventure. Um, we were living in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we sold most of our things. We packed it all in a Penske truck. We said goodbye to family. We drove to San Luis Obispo, uh, the second most never church city in America, uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and really excited and hopeful. And it's really easy for us to show a video like that and say 1,400 people came to Easter this, this, uh, this past Easter and 80 people have been back, all these. It's easy for us to share numbers and be really excited. But can I be real with you? We're in a little bit of a tired season. I feel like our hands have grown a little blistered and we've grown a little weary, a little tired. We have hit some limits of emotional, relational, mental fatigue. <laughs> and that line, they welcomed him in. I don't know if it was meant for you this week, but it was meant for me. I'm a pastor of a church and I needed to be challenged with that this week. Brent, I see that you're working hard. I see that your family sacrificed. I see that your hands are heavy at the oars. I see some of the hardship. I see some of the pain. I see some of the grief. Would you welcome me in? And man, we sang that song just a minute ago. The same God the same God who spoke to Moses, the same God who parted the seas, the same God who led this little shepherd boy, David, is waiting 
outside, in the midst, right in the midst of my situation, my overwhelmingness, your anxiety, my fear, all of it just saying, it's I. Do not be afraid. I'll wait until you welcome me in. We've gotten to see um, what happens when people welcome him in. Uh, I told you about Mark who lost a neighbor in a fire. Um, We met them as we were coaching their son's soccer team. Jenna actually started up the first conversation with Mark that led to him bringing those anxieties and fears and frustrations to our family. They attended launch Sunday at Slow City Church on September 8th, 2019. And a month after our little church launched in the heart of Slow, their oldest son, Mason, gave his life to Jesus. This is a picture of Mason being baptized. Their daughter, yeah, you can clap for that. Their daughter just got back from CIY Mix and Biola at Biola University and Mark, his wife, Kathy, are there at church. They're serving, they're exploring, they're learning to pray, they're learning who God is, they're learning to trust Jesus every single week. And I got to talk with Mark a couple weeks ago at a lacrosse game that our sons were playing in. And he said, you know, I never thought God wanted to hear my voice, but I'm learning, I'm learning that I don't have to be afraid to talk to God and that he's willing to help me, that he's willing to step in. Man, And that, mixed with this passage, for me, has just been this beautiful invitation. Where are you today? What storm are you up against? What struggle are you stuck in? May you see that he walks on the waves to get to you and me. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you're frustrated, your heart's a little hard, you're a little embittered because of some letdowns or failures or frustrations or lack of progress. Maybe you're in the room and you have never heard that God is the God who steps in to rescue you, who approaches you in the dark and the difficult and says, it's me, don't be afraid. My prayer today, wherever you are, is that you and I would receive, would welcome him. He is the God who made the sea, who steps on it to get to you, that invites you. Do not be afraid. I'm here for you. I took the cross for you to prove my love for you. I bore it all, all the shame, all the secrets, all the mistakes, all the times you couldn't put the pieces together and you were frustrated and angsty and angry. I can handle it. Will you welcome me into the boat? A few verses later in John chapter six, Jesus poignantly invites every single person with this simple line, believe in the one he has sent. Believe in the one that God has sent on your behalf. So Eastview, I'm super humbled and overwhelmed by his grace and his kindness and the opportunity to encourage you this morning. Don't give up. Look to Jesus. He walks right into your situation. He is for you, not against you. He has bore it all for you and I, and he is with you in the storm, waiting to be welcomed in. Will you believe in the one that has sent and let your belief overwhelm you, lead you through circumstances? You might be exhausted, but will you be overwhelmed by his power, by his love for you? Father, we thank you so much for today and I thank you so much um, for your word. It is alive, it is active. It does not return void. Father, and we, we are your children. We are your much loved sons and daughters of God. I pray that wherever my friends are at today, wherever we are at today, we can stop for a moment See your kindness towards us and invite you in. 
invite you into a deeper space, a deeper part of our heart, invite you into some brokenness, invite you in because you're Lord over all. We trust you. We worship you now. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all, through it all are on you and through it all through it all it is well and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well with me Be it for me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all, through it all are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. It is well. So let go my soul and trust. Ways and ways.
So Father, meet us right here. Will you bring peace in the things that don't feel peaceful? God, remind us of who you truly are. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Man, singing that song just reminds me of my grandmother. It is well. It was one of her favorite hymns. And whether she was doing stuff in the kitchen or whether we were on a trip, I could often just hear her humming um, that hymn. And it just brings peace to me, just singing that. I hope it does for you. And I just want to sit in what Brent was preaching on just a little bit longer, which is this. If, if it feels like things are exhausting right now or that you've been in a tumultuous season in your hands, you're tired from toiling, there's hope. His name is Jesus. And if you are in a storm or things are chaotic, there's hope. His name is Jesus. And we, we want to walk with you today. And so I just encourage you, please don't leave today without having connected with me or with somebody on uh, our staff or in our, in our family room. That is a place that is welcome for you to come at any time. You can share anything that God has laid on your heart, you can ask for prayer. We'd love to pray with you. But we just firmly believe and know that Jesus is real and he wants to walk with you. He's waiting for that invitation. Don't leave today if God is tugging at your heart to invite him into something more. We got a few family announcements for us and we're going to be on our way. It is July 4th weekend and the special surprise for all of us is that as you leave today, we have some dilly bars for you. So happy 4th of July for you, right? That's awesome. And uh, just a couple other things. One, thank you for your ongoing generosity. Uh, it's because of your giving, your faithful giving, that the ministries and more importantly, the name of Jesus is being spread throughout this community and in this world. So thank you. If you want to join us in this act of giving, you can find out more information on eastview.church. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, we've talked about this before, but I just want to highlight baptism real quick. It is an outward expression of an inward transformation. It's a step of faith in your walk with Jesus. It's a step of obedience. And I mention all of that because in two Sundays, July 16th is a baptism Sunday. And so maybe uh, you've been wondering, hey, when am I going to take that next step? Or maybe you're walking with somebody who is ready to do that. Um, but we'd love to invite you to July 16th, baptism Sunday, for more information on that or just to sign up. You can go to the e news, eastview.church slash e news. Speaking of that, you guys hopefully know this by now, but that is the main place that we communicate all these different things that are happening, ways for you to serve, ways for you to get connected. If you look today and read the E! News today, there's a really special uh, announcement. It has every, everything to do with the vocal team audition. And so if you uh, are talented musically, if you uh, love Jesus and you just want to help us worship on a Sunday, uh, I encourage you to check out, take a next step about this vocal team audition. I'll actually help you. I'll sign up and that will give you a better chance to make it on the team, all right? Anyway, more information on that on the E! News, and we look forward to maybe seeing you helping us lead worship in the future. So all of that to say, we get to go. And as we go, it's important to know who we, uh, who's going with us. And so if you wouldn't mind, please stand. I'm going to pray over us, but let me just remind you, Brent was saying, Jesus walks into every one of our situations. It's just a matter of inviting him in. And so here's my prayer for us. God, will you go before us today? Will you give us courage? Will you give us peace in whatever storm that we have? Will you uh, walk with us? And then God, would you help us to help others know you as well, to take the name as above every other name and bring it into our neighborhoods, into our families. God, thank you so much. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week.